Hello, everybody, and welcome to Episode 8 of the Ropeway Center Report. I'm Billy, and thank you for joining me today. Our topic today is mine trams, which are a really unique and relatively unknown part of ropeway history and one of my personal favorite topics, so I'm pretty excited. Let's get right into it. Here's what we will be going over today. First, we will introduce the concept of mine trams and provide some background information. Next, we'll go over the general history of mine trams and cover some of the most notable manufacturers of the era. This will include the monocable manufacturers like Hodgson and Halliday and the bicable manufacturers like Bleichert and Leshen. Note here that my focus is primarily on mine trams in North America, but we will also talk about some global trams as well. We will go over what the typical construction and operation process looked like for a mine tram and talk about some systems that really stand out in the historic record. We will see what modern mine trams look like today and the remaining places one can visit to see a historic mine tram. Mine trams are a form of aerial ropeway used for ore transportation. The mining explosion in the late 1800s in the Ruggy Rocky Mountains created the ideal proving ground for aerial tramway technology. Trams were an economic alternative to other forms of transportation to move ore over natural obstacles. These included roads for pack trains or railways. These trams were adept at moving ore from remote mine locations down the mountain to the mill, where it could be processed and shipped out. The turn of the 20th century was when mine trams were most prevalent. They were largely gravity powered and intended for ore, not passengers. Still, mine trams introduced or refined many ropeway components that we see on modern systems. An American industrialist named Peter Cooper built some of the first trams in the United States at blast furnaces to transport pig iron in the 1850s. At this time, tramways in Europe still marked the global standard. There were trams built in the 1860s in England, France, and Belgium at coal mines and quarries, but these systems were usually short and primitive. As we talked about in episode five of the Ropeway Center report, the 1856 Robinson patent laid out the details for a monocable ropeway. Charles Hodgson's 1868 patent strongly resembles Robinson's and in general is referred to as the English system. It used unique tripod towers with one large shiv on each side and a leather lined wooden block serving as a friction based grip to the rope. Hodgson was contacted to build the very first mine tram in the US at Treasure Hill in Nevada in 1871. The system was problematic from the beginning, including frequent grip slippage and failure and wire rope issues such as rapid wear and thermal expansion as the line descended to warmer temperatures below. It only ran for two years but still opened the ideas of mine managers to tramways for the first time. The images here are two sketches of Hodgson's English system tramway. Andrew Halliday, a wire cable manufacturer in San Francisco, best known for being the inventor of the San Francisco cable car, thought aerial trams had potential but needed refinement after observing Hodgson's tram at Treasure Hill. He filed the first patents for the endless wire ropeway in 1871. Halliday's design had some novel features, such as insert clip grips and a bull wheel called the grip pulley designed to prevent haul rope slippage by grabbing it as it passed. This design would be popular throughout early ropeways and can be seen on some old single chairlift bull wheel designs. Halliday trams were monocable and fixed grip, with the operators having to manually load and dump ore from each bucket. Note here that mine tram carriers were commonly referred to as buckets at the time. The top image shows a Halliday tram. Halliday's superior design made it popular. There were at least 24 Halliday, Halliday systems installed within 10 years of his first tram. His main competitor was Charles Hewson, who built trams that featured advanced automated loading and unloading systems. The bottom image shows workers running a Hewson tram. Monocable mine trams were simple and relatively easy to construct, although they had limited bucket capacity and speed. The peak era of monocable trams was the 1890s, but they were rendered largely obsolete by bicable technology. The roots of bicable technology go back to Theodore Otto and Adolf Bleichert, who built their first Otto Bleichert bicable ropeway in 1874. This formed the basis for bicable technology over the decades to come, although their partnership was short lived. Bleichert continued to build trams around Europe. His trams could move at faster speeds and carry higher loads in each ore bucket, owing to the detachable grip and use of a track rope to distribute the load. The Bleichert system didn't come to America until 1888 when the patents were filed and acquired by Cooper, Hewitt and Company, operator of the Trenton Iron Company of New Jersey. Thus, many Bleichert systems were referred to as Trenton trams. The original Bleichert patent is shown here in the top image. 
One of the first Blackert trams in America was the Aspen Public Tramway Company, shown here in the bottom image. It rose from the town of Aspen to the rich silver mines of the Tortolot Park region, a length of over two miles with 2,409 feet of vertical rise. The tram carried its first ore in 1890 after a long construction period. It ran until 1893, when the track rope was cut and the mining companies did not have the funds to repair it following a crash in silver prices. Nevertheless, the Aspen Public Tramway Company was an impressive demonstration of the Blackert bicable technology that caught the eye of many mine managers. It ran on a route very similar to today's Silver Queen gondola on Aspen Mountain. The bottom stations of both lifts were even in approximately the same location. Some scattered, rema scattered remains of this tram are still visible on Aspen Mountain to this day. The Blackert trams, supplied by Trenton Iron, gained popularity throughout the 1890s. However, they weren't the only manufacturer in the mine tram business. Leshen & Sons, a wire rope manufacturer from St. Louis, was a significant competitor to Trenton. They manufactured their first tram in 1886 and would build trams all the way until 1953 when they were purchased by Heron Engineering. Leshen built a number of notable trams, including the Grand Encampment Tram, which we will discuss later, and the American Nessie Tram, which featured an incredible 2,100 foot span en route from the town of Ure, Colorado, to the mine perched high above on a cliff face. The two images on the bottom are both Lesh and Tramways. On the left, a tram at the Bessie Mine in Telluride, Colorado, and on the right, a tram at Park City, Utah. Those large steel towers are still visible today in Park City and parallel the town lift at Park City Resort. Another important ropeway manufacturer that emerged in this era was Roblet. Byron Roblet built his first tram in Sandon, British Columbia in 1896. The Sandin mine manager mistakenly thought Roblet was a tramway expert, where Roblet thought he meant a mine railway. Nevertheless, he saw the project through to completion and built a 6,000-foot tram with 2,050 feet of vertical rise. Think about what a challenge that must have been to build a complete mine tramway with no background knowledge and only a few industry books to go off of. The rookie ropeway builder's lift was so successful that Byron made some improvements to his designs and established his own engineering company. Byron Roblet chiefly built trams in the Pacific Northwest until he sold his firm to Leshen and spent six years as their chief engineer for trams from 1902 to 1908. After that, he established the Roblet Tramway Company with his brother Royal out of Spokane, Washington. The company extensively built mine trams and later transitioned into one of the largest builders of ski lifts in the world at one time, totaling over 500 chairlifts worldwide. Other notable firms in the mine tram industry around the turn of the 20th century included Vulcan, Broderick and Bascom, and Pollock Auto, which was an early predecessor to PHB Hall. As you can tell, the modern ski lift industry can trace a lot back to the era of mine trams. Mine trams function somewhat similarly to modern bike cable systems with some significant differences. They use primarily wooden lattice towers spaced 200 to 400 feet apart on average although steel towers were introduced on some of the latest mine trams. The towers had saddles for the track ropes and a running shiv for the haul rope. As a carrier approached, the haul rope would lift out of the shiv, then settle back in after the carrier had passed. Large spans were possible, but mines tried to avoid them due to added cost and operational challenges. The ropes themselves usually consisted of a six-stranded haul rope and locked coil track rope, like what we expect on ropeways of today. However, Manufacturing and engineering limitations of the era meant that extreme rope wear on mine trams was common. Material limitations meant that they could change length drastically due to thermal expansion or contraction due to temperature swings in the mountains. Although many mine tram manufacturers tried automatic lubrication solutions, ropes failed frequently and often needed to be replaced after just one or two years. Installing the ropes was also an extreme challenge. A massive team of pack mules, each with a small coil of the rope, would make the long trek up to the mine site. This is shown in the bottom left image. Another difference was in rope tensioning. The long length and limits of counterweights meant that mine trams often had to have intermediate tension stations for the track ropes. The carrier would stay attached to the haul rope, which passed right through the tension terminals, but the track ropes would be deflected to counterweights below and the carrier would ride on solid rails through the terminal until it reached the next track rope. A tension station is shown in the top middle image. Sometimes larger intermediate stations were used to accomplish turns in the line or shift to a new hull rope on longer lines. Attendants would manually push the cars around the terminals. 
while clever designs allowed the carriers to speed up and slow down in the stations from the line using just attendance pushing and gravity. A loading system drawing is shown in the image on the top right. As opposed to ski lifts, mine trams were loaded mostly with downward ore. As a result, they required very little or no power to run, just large brakes to control the speed. Small gasoline, steam, or electric powered backup units were used to start the tram while well, gravity and momentum would do the rest. Weather was a major operational challenge for mine trams. High winds could tangle the ropes and massive avalanches would frequently take out the wooden towers and create extensive downtime. A down tower from an avalanche is shown on the top left. To try to avoid this on trams and major slide paths, mines would build deflection barricades to protect the towers. One mine even tunneled into the mountain to create space for a spare tower that could be erected quickly after a slide. The main type of carriers were ore buckets, which could rotate on the hangar to dump out ore at the mill terminal. However, other types of carriers were used to transport cargo and supplies up to the mine, such as special lumber carriers. Passengers could ride in the buckets along the way to the mine, but this was often dangerous as they weren't designed to be occupied. The bucket design meant that the miners' heads were perilously close to the carriage wheels and thus many tower components. This is shown in the image of the Gold King Mine Tram near Silverton, Colorado on the top right. Also note that what is now Silverton Mountain is in the background of this picture. The time saved by avoiding a hike up was worth the risk for many miners. It must have been quite a thrill to be in a mine tram bucket, spanning large ravines and scaling huge mountains to reach the site. Now that we've gone over the history and fundamentals of mine trams, it's time to look at a couple of very cool systems in a little more detail. After the 1896 discovery of gold in the Klondike region of the Yukon Territory of Canada, thousands of miners hoping to strike it rich flocked to the remote wilderness in hopes of finding a fortune. Fearing that many would starve, the Canadian government required them to bring roughly one ton of supplies, including prospecting equipment and one year's worth of food. This was a significant challenge for the miners, since the route to the gold fields at Dawson City took them over rugged alpine terrain on Chilkoot Pass. Thus, several entrepreneurs looked to growing tramway technology to transport goods for the miners. First, a series of primitive trams were built. These were a combination of surface and aerial lifts that used gravity, horses, or even steam to power the system. The first coordinated tram was built by the Daiya Klondike Transportation Company as part of an effort to provide a comprehensive transport service for goods over the pass. This short, bicable Blykert tram ran from the scales a small flat area that the Klondike Stampeders used as a staging ground before the big ascent to the summit of Chilkoot Pass. It is shown on the top right. Next, the Alaska Road and Tramway Company opened their tramway in early 1898. It was a single rope Houston tram and was gasoline powered for its trip up and over the pass. The most famous Chilkoot Tramway was built by the Chilkoot Railroad and Transportation Company and opened in 1898. This Blykert system was over nine miles long and included a large span over the scales shown in the image on the left. The bottom right image shows another big span on this tram. All three trams mostly carried cargo, but passengers were sometimes allowed to ride along with their freight. They were plagued by frequent avalanches and blizzards. The gold rush was short-lived and the railroad line constructed to Dawson City rendered the trams useless in 1899. Nevertheless, the Chilkoot Pass tramways were an impressive demonstration of ropeway technology in a harsh environment, and reports of their use encouraged many mines to consider tramways for their own operations. Southern Wyoming was home to a massive tramway in the town of Grand Encampment, which boomed after the 1897 discovery of rich copper veins in the nearby mountains. The tram had two main construction challenges. First, the incredible length between the mines and the town, and second, the very isolated location of the line. Leshen was contracted to build a 16 mile long tramway, which opened after extensive construction in 1903. Byron Rublet, then working as a chief engineer for Leshen, was in charge of construction. For the 370 wooden towers, Rublet tasked lumber crews to cut down trees from the surrounding forests. The line was split into three sections with two intermediate drive stations and 16 tension stations, along with 985 buckets along the line. It was the longest ropeway in the world when it opened. The image on the left shows the end of the tram running to the copper smelter, while the image on the right shows an intermediate station on the line. The tram ran until around 1909 when financial difficulties forced its closure.
Perhaps the most unique mine tram of this era was the Saline Valley Salt Tram, built near Death Valley, California. Seeking to transport salt from the halide deposits of the Saline Valley, White Smith and the Saline Valley Salt Company chose a tramway to cross the rugged Inyo Mountains and deliver the salt to railroad lines in the Owens Valley. A Blykert system constructed by Trenton Ironworks was chosen and the arduous construction process began in September of 1911. The isolated and rough terrain of the tramway, in addition to the harsh environment of Death Valley and technical challenges of the massive tram, combined to create a uniquely difficult construction process. Construction methods included temporary construction trams, a mule pulled platform for steep terrain called a go devil, and the now famous zigzag trail that sliced its way up from the Saline Valley through the precipitous Daisy Canyon area up to the crest of the Inyos. The weather provided everything from howling blizzards at the summit to triple digit heat in the valleys, and the tram finally opened for operation in July of 1913, despite the brutal working conditions. The tram was a system of superlatives. It stretched 13.5 miles and cost $500,000, the 2021 equivalent of $13.4 million, easily the most expensive tram of its era. The tram was the world's steepest when it opened. It first rose 7,600 feet from the Saline Valley to the top of the mountain range at 8,740 feet, then descended 5,100 feet to the unloading station in the Owens Valley. The tram profile is shown on the top left. The salt tram had five separate sections, each operated functionally as a separate tram that were connected at angle rail stations. There were 286 total buckets with covers to prevent moisture from getting into the salt on the trip. These are shown in the two lower images, and although they were intended strictly for salt transportation, the tram ended up being a vital supply line to workers at both the salt flats and at the tram stations, including a bucket used specifically for food and water transport. When operating at maximum capacity, the tram could shuttle 24 tons of salt per hour. The huge span over Daisy Canyon, the sight of the tram marching up the sharply graded Inyos, as shown on the top right, and the massive curved rail structure located at the mountain range summit created striking images that are now in the Ropeway Center glass slide collection. Although it was an engineering masterpiece, the expense of building the salt tram and subsequent plunge in salt prices made it a relatively short-lived venture. It is estimated that 30,000 tons of salt were transported over the system's operational lifetime through 1930. The Lecito La Mexicana cable car in Argentina was one of the longest aerial trams ever constructed. It traveled from the railroad at Chilecito to the Yupilungos mines in the Cordilleras Mountains, a distance of 21.4 miles with 10,584 feet of vertical rise. The sheer length of the system meant that it was divided into eight independent sections, each with several tension stations. Bleichert constructed the system beginning in 1903 and the tram opened in 1905. The magnificent tram crossed deserts, canyons, and mountains on its way to the top terminal at 13,940 feet. The elevation change was so great that many passengers had to stop at a station and recuperate from altitude sickness on the trip up. One of the most unique features was the tunnel that the tram traveled through, shown in the middle image here. Buckets traveled through a mountain on a 900-foot tunnel on rails while still attached to the hull rope, then transferred back to the track ropes at the end of the tunnel. Think of a tension station extended out for 900 feet through a tunnel. The top left image shows breakover tower construction in a ridge cutout, and the far right image shows a large span before the top terminal. There were 262 towers and 640 carriers, including special personnel cabins for workers. The tram ran at 450 feet per minute, meaning a trip took well over four hours to complete. The tram was considered an engineering marvel when it opened and had a long lifespan, running until 1974 when it was abandoned. Due to its remote location, most of the tram is still in place, as the image on the bottom left shows, which is the top station of the cable car today. The San Juan Mountains of Colorado exploded with mining activity and thus were home to a great concentration of trams around towns like Ure, Telluride, and Silverton. After mining activity had begun to wind down, the last great mine tram of this era was built and opened in 1929 at the Shenandoah Dives Mine near Silverton. The tram ran up a Rastford Gulch from the Mayflower Mill to the mine, a distance of around 10,000 feet. It was designed by Denver engineer and Colorado School of Mines graduate, Fred C. Karstarfin. The use of steel for the 11 massive towers and stations was state-of-the-art at the time. 
The tram soldiered on until 1953 when the mine closed, although it was restarted for filming of the 1957 film Night Passage. A clip from that movie is shown on the bottom right with all rights to Universal Pictures. Shifts in mineral prices, technological improvements in other transportation modes, and the prevalence of lower grade ores all contributed to mine trams falling out of favor from when they were installed at prolific levels at the turn of the 20th century. However, accessing remote mines remains an issue to this day, so there is certainly a demand for modern mine trams. Agudio is the materials ropeway branch of the Leitner Group. The image on the bottom left shows a bicable mine tram they built in Brazil in 2013. There are pretty striking similarities to the Bleichert bicable designs of the past here. A unique technology from Doppelmayr is shown on the top right called RopeCon, which uses a large moving conveyor belt suspended from track ropes across towers. It has been used around the world and can achieve very high capacities. The top left image shows a Doppelmayr advertisement from the 1990s showing how a UNI detachable terminal could be adapted for use as a mine tram. A modern evolution of this is shown on the bottom right, a Doppelmayr materials ropeway in Turkey. It uses many components from their standard gondola line, such as towers and grips, and even CWA gondola cabins to transport personnel. Mine trams are poised to play a role in the ropeway industry for decades to come. Boom and bust cycles meant that trams were often both commissioned and abandoned very quickly and most were cannibalized for parts after operation. However, the remote and rugged location of many trams means that some objects still remain, and a sharp eye can spot the remnants of many mine trams to this day. If you're the adventurous type, there are several sites you can visit to see what remains of these incredible machines today. Recently, the National Park Service performed an extensive renovation on the Keene Wonder Tramway in Death Valley to stabilize the remaining structures from collapse. Some of these towers are shown on the top right. The Saline Valley Salt Tram has many structures left standing, including the impressive summit station in the Inyo Mountains. A long backpacking track or Jeep road trip will help you visit this isolated spot. Speaking of isolated, there are several trams remaining essentially undisturbed at the Kennecott Mines within Rangel St. Elias National Park in Alaska. The large tower shown on the bottom left is from one of these trams, which extend far up into the high alpine. The best place to see mine trams today is the San Juan Mountains in Colorado, where there was once so many mine trams that famous engineer T.A. Rickard described them as spanning the intermountain spaces like great spider webs. The top left image is the remains of the Buffalo Boy Tramway near Silverton, of which the tram stations, towers, and some of the ropes are still intact and at least partially standing. The best preserved mine tram is likely the Shenandoah Dives Tram, which is also near Silverton. The large steel towers have stood the test of time and the ropes are still standing, having been secured in concrete after the tram closed. A visitor can tour the Mayflower Mill and see the unloading terminal of the tram firsthand or take a Jeep road to see the towers and top terminal. Buckets are still on the line as shown in the image of the line and mill on the bottom right. Remember, any mine tram structure you find is likely to be over 100 years old, so use caution and keep your distance from the structures. If you want to learn more, there are three great books about mine trams. The first is Riding the High Wire by Robert Trenner. This is an outstanding, extensively researched book detailing the entire history of mine trams in the American West. This was the re resource I most frequently used for this webinar and I based a lot of the content off of. I highly recommend it to anybody who is interested in ropeways. The second is Bleichert's Wire Ropeways by Peter von Bleichert, who writes an account of the history of his family company and provides some of the superlative systems that were built. The third is Tramway Titan, a comprehensive look at the life and lifts of Byron Rublet. These are all found at the Information Center for Ropeway Studies or available to purchase through Amazon. Here are all the references I used to put together today's webinar episode. All of these are either available online or through the Information Center for Ropeway Studies. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's episode. Mine trams were a fascinating chapter of ropeway history. Major technological leaps were made in areas such as tower structures and grips, while some seriously impressive systems were built. Imagine designing a tram through the most rugged terrain imaginable, using a slide rule for calculations and performing essentially all construction by hand. With so many mine trams having been removed, it's hard to get a grasp of how commonplace they were at one time. They also left a strong legacy on the industry. 
Byron Oblet's company transitioned to a leading ski lift manufacturer, while Bliker technology was later used on the first passenger aerial trams and the first ski lifts with American steel and wire. Ropeways wouldn't be where they are today without the advances made during the age of mine trams. On a final note, this is sadly the last episode of the Ropeway Center report from me, as I'll be graduating this semester. Thank you very much for tuning into this webinar series. We have covered everything from historical ropeways to modern ropeways, all using the resources available at the Information Center for Ropeway Studies. I hope all of it has made you more curious about ropeways and interested in using the resources available at the Ropeway Center. I certainly have very much enjoyed getting to produce this webinar series and I've I enjoyed going the cool places that it has taken me. Remember that the center is available to both mine students and the general public. So contact a librarian at the Arthur Lakes Library if you're interested and want to learn more. From new technological developments to the emergence of urban ropeways, this industry has a very bright future. Thank you very much once again for watching the Ropeway Center Report. I greatly appreciate it, and I'll hopefully see you out on the chairlift sometime. See ya!